we are going to go over questions 51 through 65 of the June 2019 Chemistry Regions exam, better known as Part B-2. With question 51, draw a structural formula for methanol. Well, this is an organic compound. How do I know that? Meth is a prefix. Al is an ending. And I recognize this already just from the prefix. There are three reference tables that have to do with organic chemistry right away. As soon as you identify this, you want to go to those reference tables. Let's do that right now. For meth, meth means one carbon atom. An AL ending is going to tell me now that I have a functional group. And let's take a look at why. If it was just carbons and hydrogens, better known as hydrocarbons, it would have had an ANE, an ENE, or a YNE ending. But the ending is AL. So that means we need to go to reference table R. With reference table R, literally just go through each one. And you're going to see for halides here, you're going to have any of these groups, which is going to show up as a prefix. It wasn't there. Can't be it. I go to alcohols. The ending is OL. Well, we need AL. Can't be it. Ether, the name ether is in the name. Well, that was real smart, but the word ether is in the name. It wasn't there. We go to aldehydes next. Oh, here's my ending, AL. All right, so it's an aldehyde, only one carbon. Now, don't forget, carbon forms four bonds. This is propanol. Propanol has three carbons. We want one molecule that only has one carbon. So let's use that functional group. Carbon's used up three of the bonds, it would have one left, so I'd have to add a hydrogen, and that would be methanol. The next three questions, 52 through 54, have to do with the information here in this table, and it has to do with naturally occurring isotopes of hydrogen. We're also given information here that isotope H-2 is also called deuterium, and is usually represented by the symbol D and heavy water is when deuterium reacts with oxygen and we get D2O. So with all that information, let's tackle the question. For 52, explain in terms of subatomic particles why atoms of H1, H2, and H3 are each electrically neutral. Now, when we have to explain anything in terms of, make sure that you answer the question and have the whatever they're highlighting in mind. Subatomic particles, there are three. Your protons, your neutrons, and your electrons. Protons have a positive charge. Neutrons have no charge. Electrons are negative. Atoms are electrically neutral because the number of protons equals the number of electrons. That's the answer there for 52. For 53, you're asked to determine the formula mass of D2O as opposed to H2O. What do we need? We need the atomic masses. The atomic mass for deuterium is here, and then we're gonna need the atomic mass for oxygen on the periodic table. I'll show you how I have my students figure out atomic masses. First thing you're always gonna do is list the different elements in the compound, and then the number of times they appear in the formula for deuterium. We're going to get that right off of the table. For oxygen, we would get that from the periodic table. So let's go do that right now. All right, so we're looking for oxygen, and we need the atomic mass. That is going to be the upper left-hand corner at 15.99994. Now, a little bit about rounding an atomic mass. Unless it's specified in the question, you have to go out it specific number of decimal places or significant figures most people will round the oxygen atomic mass to 16. i don't see any reason why we can't do that here so let's go back i need to write this out again because i lost it right i have my d i have my o i have two and i have one deuterium is the 2.0141 we're going to just go ahead and make it two oxygen 16 two times two is four and 16 so my answer is 20 uh, that would be 20 u for the units if you take it out more decimals that's fine 
there was no indication in the question we had to go out to specific decimal places or sig figs. That's your answer. Let's go on to 54. For 54, based on table N, identify the decay mode of tritium. If I look up here at tritium, and it is isotope H-3. In other words, it's hydrogen with a mass number of 3. Let's go to reference table N. We're here at reference table N. We're looking for tritium, or H3. Here it is. Decay mode is the third column, and that is beta minus. You could just write the symbol, but don't forget the negative sign, or you could write out what it is. Let me show you one other table here with nuclear. You got table N, N, O. So for your answer, you could have just wrote the beta symbol N minus, or you could just indicate that it is beta decay. That's it. We are moving on. Questions 55 through 57 are using the information that's given here for all of them. And you notice, by the way, these solid lines. So that always separates when you get to part B-2 and part C, the clumps of questions that are together. Question 55, we're asked to convert the temperature of the sodium nitrate to kelvins. We're given 23 degrees Celsius. Don't forget about reference table T. That's where your mathematical equations are. So to make absolutely sure, let's go and check that out. And sure enough, here it is at the bottom. That Kelvin is going to be equal to Celsius plus 273. 23 plus 273 to get our answer. Now, I know it sounds silly. Use your calculator. You don't want to make any mistakes. And write down the correct answer. 2. 96. Let's go back to the test. 296 here. Kelvin. Let's go to, to uh, 56. Based on table G, determine the additional mass of sodium nitrate that must be dissolved to saturate the solution at 23 degrees Celsius. We are going to go ahead to the solubility curves, table G, and let's see how you would answer this question. Okay, so we're, we're here at table G, and we need to find the sodium nitrate line, which starts up here and goes down. Sorry, this is so, so small to see, but I wanted to get the whole thing in there. We're dealing with 23 degrees Celsius. We're going to go approximately wherever you think that might be, between 20 and 30. We're going to go up, and then we're going to go over. It looks to me that we can fit... For saturated solution, that's the maximum amount you can fit of a solute, in this case, in, an, in 100 grams of water, 90 grams. But 90 grams isn't our answer. We already had some sodium nitrate in solution, so we're going to have to subtract that um, from the 90. So we want to know the additional mass to get it from being unsaturated to saturated. We're starting with 85. To saturate it would be 90, so 90 minus 85 is 5 gram. For 57, state what happens to the boiling point and freezing point of the solution when the solution is diluted with an additional 100 grams of water. When we were going through the test in June, the group of chemistry teachers, we found that a lot of students made the mistake here doing it the opposite because they didn't read the question. New York State loves to give you questions that answer seems obvious, but if you really read it and pay attention, you realize you need to do something else. And this is exactly that example here in 57. When you add more solute to a solution, boiling point goes up and the freezing point goes down. But that's not what's happening here in 57. In 57, we're diluting the solution by adding more solvent. What does that mean then? That means that the boiling point is going to get lowered and the freezing point is going to get raised. Or the boiling point is decreasing and the freezing point is increasing. 57 is a little tricky. It's going to be straightforward if you've read the question, but be careful with all of these regions questions because they are at times tricky questions. Let's move on to the next group, 58 through 60.
one. We have information up here, and we're going to be dealing with four questions in 58. State a change in temperature and change in pressure of the carbon dioxide gas that would cause it to behave more like an ideal gas. Any gas is going to behave more like an ideal gas when we increase the temperature and we decrease the pressure. That's a fact, Jack. You have to know it, and you needed it here in question 58. For 59, determine the volume of a sample of carbon dioxide gas if the temperature and pressure are changed too. So Kelvin is temperature, kilopascals is pressure. We need the combined gas law, which is on reference table T. So let's go and get it. We have our combined gas law down here. Now one um, note here, pressure and volume need to be consistent on both sides of the equal sign, but your temperature always has to be in kelvins. So make sure that if one of those temperatures is not given to you in Kelvin, instead it's given to you in degrees Celsius, you switch it over. We got P, P1, V1 over T1 equal to P2, V2 over T2. I like to write the equation down so that I see it in front of me and we plug things in correctly and you see where they're coming from. Our initial conditions are in the original sentence. For the pressure, I'm going to put it down here, 101.3 kPa. We don't need the units. I'm just doing this so you can see my volume, 200 mils, and my temperature, 298K. All right, on the other side, we're looking for volume. We have 152 kPa. We're looking for V2. And on the other side, we also have 336 Kelvin. It's just a question now of cross multiplying and dividing in order to get the answer. I can go ahead and multiply this together. I can multiply this together and then divide. Use that calculator. You should get an answer of 150 and the units are going to be the same as what we started with, which is milliliters. You are setting it up correctly and not getting the right answer. Go back and Work with that calculator until you do. It's very important that you go through the trouble of setting everything up correctly, that you actually calculate the answer. Make sure that you can. Move it on to 60. State in terms of both. If you leave one out, you're not going to get the point here. The frequency and force of collisions that would result from decreasing the temperature of the original sample at constant volume. Well, you should remember from class that temperature is a measure of kinetic energy of the particles. So if we decrease the temperature, we're going to decrease the frequency and decrease the force of the collisions between those particles. In other words, the molecules of CO2 that are slamming into one another in the container. Both the frequency and the force would decrease. Question 61, compare the mass of the original 200 milliliter sample to the mass of the CO2 sample when the cylinder is adjusted to a volume of 100 milliliters. Nothing is changing as far as the moles of gas, and if the moles of gas are not changing, the mass remains the same. All right, so we are at the last group of questions, 62 through 65. Let's do this. 62, explain in terms of both protons and neutrons why cobalt 59 and 60 are isotopes of cobalt? Well, isotope, that is one of those special words in chemistry, more specifically to the chemistry regions exam, you have to know the definition of. Same number of protons, meaning it's atoms of the same element, different number of neutrons. Cobalt 60 is going to have one more neutron than cobalt 59. It says explain in terms of both protons and neutrons. Protons are staying the same, but cobalt 60 has one more neutron. If you actually want to figure out protons and neutrons and answer the question that way, you could as well. For 63, compare the penetrating power of beta and gamma emissions. This is a fact, Jack, that gamma emissions are higher than beta emissions when it comes to penetrating 
power. Gamma missions do more damage than beta and beta than alpha. Penetrating power, it goes gamma is the most, beta, and then alpha the least. It's a fact you need to know. It. Once again, just like the other parts of the regions exam, definitions and facts come into play along with some skills. For 64, complete the nuclear equation in your answer booklet for the decay of cobalt 60 by writing, by writing, by writing a notation for the missing product. The missing product here is X. Let's take a look at this real simple when it comes to finding missing particles with nuclear equations. Nuclear equations require that you balance the mass numbers on either side of the equation, that they're equal, and the atomic numbers on either side. We have 60 here on the left. We have 0 plus 0 plus, of course, what's going to equal 60? It's going to be 60. When it comes to atomic number, we have 27 here on the bottom. We have a minus 1 plus 0 plus what number is going to get us to 27? And of course, that's 28. 28 minus 1 is 27. So I'm dealing with, I'm going to just put it over here now, a particle that has a mass number of 60, atomic number of 28. I need to use the periodic table to identify the element by the atomic number. So let's go do that. Element 28 is nickel. In your answer booklet then for 64, we would write nickel. Don't forget about the 60. That's most important because as long as we have nickel, we know it's element 28. Let's move on to the last question here, 65. Based on table N, determine the total time required for 80 gram sample of cobalt 60 to get to decay to only 10 grams of the sample remaining unchanged. Table N is one of the two nuclear tables and we need the half-life for cobalt 60 so let's go do that had reference table n the half-life for cobalt 60 5.271 years we'll bring that back to the question and finish up part b-2 i'm going to show you a way to determine this using a table time and mass. At time zero, we had 80 gram sample, and over time it decayed. And we call it a half-life because it's the time it takes for approximately half of the original sample mass to decay into something else. It doesn't go away, it changes into a different isotope. At first half-life, we wouldn't have 80 grams of the sample anymore, we would have 40. That's one half-life. From 40, the next half-life, another 5.271 years later, we would have 20 grams left, and then the next half-life, 20 goes to 10. We're having the mass as we go, and for time, we're adding. This took one, two, three half-lives. So all I have to do is take my three and multiply it by 5.271 years to get the total time that elapsed. Our answer here then, when I take the half-life and multiply it by three, is 15.813 years. It did not specify in the question how many decimal places to go out or um, sig figs. However, if you did round this, look at to the whole number. The number 8 is here. It should bump up to 16. I know there are a few students that might just drop everything to the right of the decimal, but that would be rounding incorrect. We are done with B-2. One more part to the chemistry regions. This is the June 2019 is part C. Keep working hard and going over questions. I would suggest going over ones that you got incorrect the first time and correct your mistakes. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already and keep working hard. Good luck.